I first met Ken Nolan at Black Mountain College in the summer of 1950 when I was doing a teaching stint down there for six weeks. And uh, we became friends. I, I didn't particularly admire his painting at that time. No, I didn't. Uh, he was a student. I think he was, what, in his middle 20s at that time. And uh, then uh, he uh, lived in Washington. He came to Washington shortly afterwards. He came from Asheville originally. And he'd come up to New York, and I'd see him. And I noticed he was always struggling as a painter. Uh, he wasn't giving up. And uh, Nolan's breakthrough came, as I see it, at the end of 57, when he uh, dared to paint pictures that were symmetrical in every direction, not only laterally symmetrical, but vertically. And from then on, Nolan had found his way, too, which he pursued with uh, less or uh, fewer divagations than Lewis did. I, Maybe that uh, was to his own credit. I think also Nolan benefited by Lewis's experience to some extent. Uh, there's no question Nolan has never uh, uh, ceased to say, you know, how much of a debt he owes to Lewis. At the end of his life, Lewis was saying he owed a great debt to Nolan. And uh, uh, that's the way it is between the, the way it was, uh, between two artists who respected one another. Abstract expressionism was the culmination of attitudes in painting, which go all the way back to Cezanne. The picture had become an arena of activity, of formal tensions, full of violent gesture, thick, juicy paint, and expressive color. Now all this has changed. Two painters from Washington, Morris Lewis and Kenneth Noland, have helped the next generation to find a new way along the path of abstraction. Lewis, 12 years older than Noland, died in 1962 at 50. This is a film about their ideas and their common development. The painting of Lewis and Noland depends on the spatial resonance and lyric potential of pure color. Their painting seems strange and different because it eliminates the familiar preoccupation with the manipulation of forms in relational terms. It's not about making interesting or expressive arrangements of shapes, not about the beauty and expressiveness of drawing. Although they develop their ideas together, Lewis, the older of the two, found his own way first. His veils, translucent curtains of subtle color, owe something to the earlier tradition of French art. Noland moved boldly into a new area of intense and opaque color, which gives his work an exciting new look. He in turn influenced the late work of Lewis, the stripes and diagonal rivers of color. Kenneth Noland, who lives and works in Bennington, Vermont, on a farm that belonged to the poet Robert Frost, has become one of the most important figures in the energetic new art scene centered in New York City. He has influenced a whole group of young painters with the technique of staining color into raw canvas, which he developed along with Lewis. He was born in North Carolina, studied at Black Mountain, and taught at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Washington, D.C., where he met and became a close friend to Morris Lewis, a man with few friends. As a person, Morris Lewis remains a remote and extraordinary figure whose work tells us more about his vision and sensibility than the accounts of eyewitnesses. Marcella Brenner of Washington, D.C., the widow of Morris Lewis, talks about their life together. I believe we moved into the house on Legation Street in 1952. Uh, this was a very great day to be able to have a little bit more space. It's an old house, and we completely changed the interior so that there would be some space for Morris to work. The large room that ordinarily would be a dining room was 
made completely empty and it became a studio. And he was able to have a good deal of privacy there. And he worked there all of the time. It was just off the kitchen, but might as well have been in Siberia because not very many people entered. And when he was finished with the painting, he would, it would dry and he would roll it up. And I didn't see it, nobody saw it until those occasional times when somebody would come down from New York, perhaps, to have a look. And then if I were fortunate and not teaching that day, I might have a look, and I might not. Mrs. Helen Jacobson, a painter from Baltimore, Maryland, one of a few privileged to study with Lewis. Morris Lewis was a tall, very slender man with piercing dark eyes The eyes that said, don't tell me anything but the truth, many times to his students, he would say exactly what he thought, and sometimes this was devastating. When he said that he liked your painting, it would set the student up for the four weeks that would intervene before seeing him again, so much so that you would work day and night to earn this bit of praise again. People often ask how I was able to contain my curiosity about what Morris was painting. Living in the same house and knowing that the painting was going on in the same house. It was indeed difficult, but I respected his need not to be bothered, annoyed, pestered. And I knew that I did not really understand what he was up to. And I also knew that he did not want to have to explain. I think he did to some degree to his students, or in a way it came through to them, but he didn't otherwise very much talk about it, except perhaps to people like Clem. Morris met Clem Greenberg through Kenneth Noland. Morris was working at the Washington workshop, teaching a couple of evenings a week. Kenneth was also teaching there. Kenneth was very much interested in what Morris was doing, and as I said, saw to it that he met Clement Greenberg. Kenneth came to the house, we visited the Nolans, and Kenneth used to like, I think, to get Morris to talk about what he was doing, and very early on, Kenneth was determined that Clement Greenberg should see Morris's painting. And Kenneth arranged it. The critic Clement Greenberg, perhaps with Ken Noland, the only other lasting friend Morris Lewis had. I remember doing this new talent show for the Coots Gallery in 53, I think. I always forget the date. It may have been 54. And Ken just before, oh, so six months before that show, brought Morris Lewis up with him to New York. And uh, I remember being struck by Lewis's personality. And I took them both over to Helen Frankenthaler's studio. And they flipped for a certain picture of hers. It was Helen Frankenthaler who devised a method of flowing paint onto unsized canvas. This woman's technique and painting had a completely profound impact on Lewis and Nolan. Uh, Clem brought Morris and Ken around after I had done this big picture called Mountains and Sea and another picture like it called uh, Shatter, uh, just smaller, and a whole series of which this was one in 52. And, um, very few people who had seen these pictures responded at all. Um, Clem did, Friedel did, um, a few people who 
saw my pictures at uh, the Tibor Denage Gallery, but very few. I mean, most of them would say, what is this girl about? Um, you know, it just looks like um, blots of soaked, smeared um, marks. Uh, and both uh, Ken and Morris um, did get it, or if they didn't get it, felt they wanted to. But I think, um, I think Clem was the one who had the recognition originally. And then when I put that new talent show on, it was much against my better judgment. Uh, but, well, it was, and there was very little in New York to put in it. And I filled it up. I filled the walls of the gallery and without, and I hadn't seen a picture of Morris Lewis's yet. And yet I felt that I had him up my sleeve. And I went down to Washington and uh, sure enough, he seemed to me the, uh, you know, the justification for the show. And I put three fairly big pictures of his in the show. Uh, I'd say uh, uh, Lewis's pictures at that time, and this was as he, what he considered, and I considered the beginning of his breakthrough, uh, influenced by Pollock and Frankenthaler. Mm, that was, he opened up with what I'd call the spatter, leaving much more uncovered canvas than Pollock or had, and maybe even more than Frankenthaler had, though. And for Morris, this was the release of what you can only call a, a gush of inspiration. We became friends, and I would see him whenever I went to Washington, which was, let's say, once in six months back then. He would come up to New York. Clement always tried to persuade Morris to come to New York more, and was not always successful. And as a matter of fact, they used to joke about it because Morris would go to New York because he absolutely had to go to New York for an occasion to plan a show or to appear at an opening, which he very much did not like to do, and would come home the very next morning. And he, he, never, he didn't want to ever not be home because he wanted to paint and had nothing to do with anything else. And he used to think it was, it was kind of absurd that people would go spend their time at some village bar and then not be in the studios the next morning. He found that unthinkable. Morris had one contact in New York that was very meaningful to him, I'm sure, and this was his contact with Helen Frankenthaler. He was very happy to meet her, very happy to see what she was doing. Um, I knew Morris less well, but um, have clearer memories of him in those days, I think because he was such an eccentric. And my only memory, and probably the only memory anybody has of him, is painting, uh, which is all he did or thought about or talked about or was interested in. He was very much a person. He was completely concerned with his painting. He had very few doubts on the one hand and nothing but doubt on the other. Uh, there was no question what he was doing. There was no doubt that this was what one needed to do seven days a week. He never could understand how anybody wanted a vacation or to go away or to not paint. And he, I think he was painting better at the time, of his day, uh, just before he took sick, than he ever had before. I won't say that the, his la last pictures were necessarily better than those he'd done in, from the, end, uh, the late 57 on to 60, but I thought Lewis was showing who could draw as well as hand color in those very last pictures. You always have to be able to draw, you know what I mean? But uh, 
Lewis was spelling it out in some of those diagonals of which three were shown in his last one-man show. And uh, uh, he was really uh, an inspired artist. Well, uh, anybody who uh, moves you in a, as an artist to write or compose it has to be inspired. The painting Nolan and Lewis saw the first day they visited Helen Frankenthaler is called Mountains and Sea. We asked Ken Nolan what it meant to him. There was no accessible way to use uh, Pollock's influence, uh, you know, without uh, making the appearance of a kind of an imitative thing. Uh, and Helen's pictures were the first ones we'd seen that uh, had used Pollock's influence successfully. Well, the painting was uh, uh, thrown loosely into an, a free space in some kind of way. I mean, um, a phrase that we used at that particular, particular time a lot was uh, one-shot painting. Uh, we were very interested in the idea of that, uh, uh, making a picture quickly, uh, put everything down once, and letting it stand, uh, uh, you know, first off. If you stop and think about those uh, stained pictures of Pollock's, I mean, you know, say the stained black ones on raw canvas, uh, that's all one-shot painting. Uh, those things were thrown once and once only and unmodified. It was particularly, I think, those black and white ones, uh, that black enamel on stained into raw canvas that uh, were very impressive because it immediately welded and froze uh, everything together. It was the, the looseness and the openness of it, you know, the fact that it uh, wasn't involved in the kind of conventional cliches of painting at that particular point. Um, just the sheer straightforwardness and openness of it that impressed us the most. From my point of view, it seemed to work out um, that Morris was able to uh, execute uh, in a more um, immediate way concepts about painting. He could turn them right into pictures. Um, and I think I benefited more from uh, watching, I mean, looking at his pictures and uh, uh, his tech technical uh, invention, whereas I think he was uh, um, more influenced by my thinking and my conception. And it wasn't until about 1958 that uh, I had my own breakthrough in terms of uh, getting a way to work for myself. After we got back together, well, the relationship uh, had kind of changed. Um, I think it was more equality existed. Uh, Morris then, uh, I think, respected me more as a uh, peer and as an equal, as a painter. And then I think that Morris had to uh, then um, make concessions to I me. Mean, I think uh, uh, he, in turn, had an influence, uh, was influenced by me. It had to do more with color than anything else, uh, laying out uh, color directly. Um, Morris uh, had used color, as you know, in those veils uh, to, uh, what well, you might say, a suppressed uh, uh, tonality or value uh, distribution of the, of the color. And uh, after I began to lay colors out uh, uniquely and separately apart and um, primarily in their brilliance, you know, like in the, in the circles, Morris had to come over to that. 
I didn't have to, but I mean, he did. Well, and the stripes and the unfurled pictures and uh, the awning pictures and those pictures where he started using color uh, as separate uh, stripes or bands. When I heard that Morris had died, I was, you know, very, very shocked and very upset because um, we were very much involved uh, in our stands in art together. You know, I mean, uh, there was a whole uh, very complicated structure of uh, our relationship uh, as painters um, where um, we bounce things off, uh, you know, bounce things back and forth, uh, used uh, our rel relative positions to, um, well, it was very involved. Like many painters today, Noland often works in series. His current one is sparse, moving in a different direction. Uh, it gets more complicated because what I've gone into, I want to say, these diamond pictures, um, is it begins to get more difficult because I don't start from any specific place, like, say, the center or the bottom, uh, the center of the bottom of a shape to make, uh, you know, an irradiating extension like in chevrons and so forth. Um, I've taken that out, but in order to get away from having a specific origin inside the space, um, I had to make, uh, to put another specific character in it, which is a sequence. Now I'm using colors and uh, in sequences, uh, progressions. Whereas me using these the diamonds too, I destroy shape even more by using diamonds than uh, than I did when I was using squares, which were self-canceling rectangles. The most self-canceling rectangle there was. I mean, you know, because they were equal on all sides and so forth. But just to say it was just the same. It was being determined. Uh, by the sides. But I found that uh, you can, by, say, turning the points and making those the furthest uh, uh, extensions in the space, that uh, that cancels out shape even more. It neutralizes uh, the condition of shape because you only have an extension uh, say horizontally from one point to another point, the furthest extension, say horizontally, and the furthest extension vertically uh, to two other points. The sloping sides uh, aren't confining. Nolan, like Lewis, works on unstretched canvas on the floor, except in some smaller pictures where the canvas is pre-stretched. Well, I know, I knew uh, when I started out that I was going to go, I was going to make a progression from black, uh, let's see, one, let's see, one, two, three, four times towards uh, lighter colors. I mean, you know, going from dark to light. I knew I was going to do that. And, uh, Uh, well, I was painting the black, I just uh, thought I'd use ultramarine, you know, and, and make it uh, begin to develop that way. I have no idea what other colors I'll put up there yet, because I can make it go any way I damn well please. I can turn it to yellow, I, you know, I can turn it to green, light green, uh, turn it to purple, I could turn it, you know, to anything, turn it to gray. And I don't know, after I look at these two, uh, I'll decide the next time which way to make it uh, go, huh? You know mysteries. Mm. 
It's, you know, it's not, uh, there's not, nothing mysterious about it. It's very seldom I ever work, uh, even when I'm working on a series of pictures. Uh, about every third picture, uh, uh, I do make a another kind of picture. Uh, another layout. Um, partly as a relief, you know, to keep it from, from getting some too mechanical. And uh, it, it uh, gives me a little bit of leverage on what I'm doing. Uh, it tells me comparatively uh, something about what I'm doing, what uh, other potentials are at the same time. Sometimes uh, they come together, uh, they, they, they merge, and other times uh, a series of pictures I'm doing on the side, you know, about every third picture I'm adding into a, a series of pictures, become a series themselves, but a slower series. Like Lewis, he has become one of the painters most sought after by contemporary collectors. Noland enjoys a special distinction as a young, old master of modern American art. Yet he continues to develop and expand the possibilities of this vital new abstract art. Uh, the success, uh, I um, had had, you know, different shows, uh, like at different stages, different things mean so there's, n there's another high, higher level. You think that if, say, for instance, you get a picture in a group show, then people are going to see it, and that's going to be something. Or if somebody writes about it in uh, uh, a review or something like that, that that'll be uh, something, a level, you know? Or if you get a first one-man show in New York, then everything is going to be okay. You know, there's always something a little bit ahead of... Uh, uh, but I got on to that. And I realized that success, uh, any kind of success, uh, really didn't uh, add up to very much, except practically, that uh, uh, it brought in money. And the money was something I could use uh, to live uh, better and to work better, uh, you know. So I was, I, was, I was interested in making money more than anything else, because it meant that I could uh, do one that, what I wanted to do. In the search for a more intricate mode of expression and of relation to the viewer, all previous preconceptions about the way a picture is made and the nature of the response to it have been set aside. Nolan's special distinction lies in his understanding of the possibilities of a more subtle and complex exploit of expressiveness, ambiguity. The special vision of the artist to create a new abstract painting. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network.